I'm going to hit record and we're going. All right, so I this is I my name is Kari Kwas. I am with the Snohomish Conservation District and tonight we are talking about smart watering and our uh, featured speaker is Lad Smith from In Harmony. Um, so we are going to uh, hopefully all learn smart ways to water and not spend too much money where we don't need to. So we'll get into all of that soon enough. I wanted to make sure and thank the uh, City of Everett for sponsoring this Natural Yard Care series, as well as our partnership with WSU Extension, with the Master Gardeners, and then also, again, Snohomish Conservation District. So my name is Kari Kwas. If you went to our plant sale, that's probably how you saw me and pretty much anywhere out and about wearing a mask. Um, we have a ton of events. In particular, this April, we did a lot of webinars. And so our website is chock full. Um, this is being recorded. We've recorded a bunch of other ones. So you could really uh, just spend hours <laughs> looking at lots of information, which is super um, that we've been able to do this. So quickly what Conservation District is, we are a state agency, a special district. Our district, Snohomish Conservation District, represents Snohomish County and uh, Camano Island. We've been around for 80 years this year, which is really exciting. Um, we help with uh, free technical site visits and we have a lot of information. We do youth education and generally we have some sort of cost share so we can help with projects too. So tonight, um, please answer your or ask your questions through the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And um, Karen from uh, WSU Extension will be helping with that process. Feel free to ask them anytime. And Lad is happy to answer them as they come up. And then we'll obviously have time at the end as well. So please ask questions. That makes it all the better. And thank you to um, the people who all, when you registered, also put in questions. Lad has those, so he's going to make sure and cover everything that you've talked about this evening. So with me tonight is April Hines, and I have her unmute and then show herself, and she has some things she'd like to share. Um, I was going to actually stay off video since you have such a lovely photo of me. I'd rather just have that. <laughs> you can try it again if you'd like. <laughs> um, but I'm, yes, hello. I'm April Hines. I'm the Public Information Education Specialist with City of Everett, and we're very happy to have you guys all here tonight. Um, I do want to point to, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. Um, I do want to go ahead and point to the fact that um, we really put on these green garden, green home programs twice a year. We do them in the spring and the fall. And we really do it as a way to educate the public about the importance of dealing with stormwater management on your property. So whether that be through natural yard care practices or whether it be through putting in a rain garden or smart watering, there's all these different tools that we want to give you so that you you can make better choices as to how you want to deal with stormwater on your property. Um, so I do want to highlight that um, after tonight, we do have our uh, rain garden rebate program, kind of a chit chat that we're going to have on noon on Thursday. So in addition to being able to do it through the invite, um, the Everett invite, we're also going to be doing it Facebook Live through the City of Everett webpage. So that's another um, opportunity to catch it in case you don't register in time. Um, but it, you can also register for the rain garden tour so you can get a map of some of the local rain gardens. Since it's still not raining, you will have an opportunity to maybe get out before Thursday. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I wanna just quickly point out is the next utility bill insert that will be starting next week. We actually are highlighting the yard watering calendar, which you get annually with your utility bill, um, highlighting when is a good time to water so that you're hopefully helping you not overwater. And it also gives you a couple of tools on smart watering. But in addition to that, we're actually working with the Everett Public Library to do some water conservation kits. So you will be able to go to the library and pick up these kits. So along with having uh, a lot of different activities for kids, it'll also have some of our um, uh, conservation items that we normally give out at Public Works. Since our buildings are still closed, we really wanted to find a way to reach out to Everett citizens and allow them an opportunity to pick up some of these um, great resources that you can have and use on your um, properties. So I just wanted to highlight that. You can look for that coming next week. And I think with that, I'll turn it back over to Kari. Great. Thank you, April. So again, with me tonight, I have Karen Panic. She's with. She's one of the master gardeners. She's going to be um, fielding the questions this evening and passing those on to Lad. 
And then just a little bit about the master gardeners. They're awesome. <laughs> and I recommend highly that you reach out to them. Um, they offer garden advice and they uh, help with practices like integrated pest management. And like when I've called in the past, if they don't know the answer right away, they'll look it up for you and come back with some sound advice. So here's the two ways to get a hold of them. That would be through their hotline, 425-357-6010, or through their email, snowcomg at gmail.com. And so tonight then, I would like to also introduce our featured speaker, Lad Smith, who in 1994 uh, co-founded In Harmony Sustainable Landscapes with his business partner, Mark Guile, out of his lifelong passion for protecting the environment. In Harmony Sustainable Landscapes is a provider of organic-based landscape services in King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties. He earned his BS degree in ornamental horticulture from the University of Nevada, Reno, in Harmony has received numerous awards, including the prestigious Washington State Governor's Award for Pollution Prevention, uh, the Northwest Environmental's Guide, oh, excuse me, in, uh, Environmental Achiever of the Year Award, and the WSNLA 20, 2007 Environmental Excellence Award. Um, so we're really happy to have him here. He's been featured in a bunch of magazines and has been a regular presenter in King County and also with Snohomish County Natural Yard Care. So at this point, I will stop sharing and then turn it over to Lad. Thank you, Kari, very much. Let me see if I can get this, my part done now. Okay, let's see if now it'll start. All good. Well, there you go. There it is. Woohoo! <laughs> well, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Kari, April, and Karen for um, all their work and putting all this together for you folks. And I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight. Hope I have some pretty good information for you um, on just really taking care of this precious resource that, that we call water. And um, uh, it's the natural yard care way is how I kind of title it too. And it's based on really the, the natural yard care pamphlet. Um, and this is available and all the other pamphlets I'll show you here are available on the Snohomish County uh, website. And they have a natural yard care page. And you can download, uh, print off if you want to the natural yard care booklet. But, you know, I've been into uh, gardening landscaping now for almost 40 years. And um, really, it comes to this gardening is not that difficult. If we just follow these basic steps, it's amazing how easy our gardening becomes. But the first step of natural yard care is building healthy soils. And I'll talk about that a little bit, but healthy soils is really should be our main garden practice. And what we're trying to do is make sure we're taking care, good care of our soils. Number two is right plant, right place. And number three is smart watering. And I'll talk about that extensively tonight, but really they all go hand in hand. If we have good soils, if we have the right plant in the right place and we're taking care of its um, watering needs, uh, we'll have very successful yards. And this right here is a picture of my yard um, this is one of my favorite spots, my hammock, and it, it's one of my favorite spots because I'm really trying to make my gardening easier in order to be able to spend more time doing the things like I like to do. And I love gardening, but I like laying in my hammock too. And, um, and this is a nice spot. And this spot I water a couple times a year just because I've really built up the soils and I have plants that really thrive in this little shady area and stuff like that. And I'll talk about all those things as we go on, okay? But what I'm going to start off with tonight, first of all, is the big picture, because it really is about storm water runoff that we're seeing, and also, um, conversely, water conservation during the summertime when we have little or no moisture coming out of the sky, and we need to add or supplement water for our, our landscapes and our plants to be successful. And then it's all really based on healthy soils, and that's why I'll kind of throw a little bit about soils, because just like in the natural yard care, healthy soils are, the, are a key. And if we're really understanding that, if we're really trying to build those soils and do what the soils need, you'd be amazed on how the plants and um, how well they do, but not only how well they do, but healthy plants are better users of water. So we're not over watering to get what we're looking for out of our plants. And then we'll talk about smart water practices tonight, okay? So first of all, the big picture. Does anybody recognize the big picture here, you know? Even though we are sending, um, people to Mars, possibly, you know, and going back to the moon, this little orb really is a garden of Eden for us. And it has 
everything we ever would need in our lives to be successful, you know. And we have the land that we can grow food on and everything. That's all the brown. And then we have moisture, you know, the, the world's covered with two thirds of uh, water, most of it's salt water, and that's a challenge, but it's mostly water. And then you have all the white stuff that just kind of circles around, and that's the clouds. <clears throat> and I really have, now that I live in Washington, I've really come to really love clouds. And I would have read one time about a, a gentleman who had moved here from uh, Europe who was a cloud expert. And the reason he moved to Washington is that we have the coolest clouds in the world because of our mountain ranges and our big water body, the Puget Sound and our lakes and just how everything works and stuff like that. Just the amount of clouds that come over here and we see it all the time, right? But, uh, but just how special those clouds are because they're really the, the uh, main way that water is recycled from big bodies of water like the ocean, brought up over to land and then deposited on land so that we get fresh water. And it's the only way that fresh water is recycled is through this hydrologic cycle where you know water generated from the sun because that's you know heat comes up with evaporation and then it gets into the clouds and then as it moves over um, the land it comes down as precipitation you know rain sleet hail snow all the ways that water comes back down and then works its way back down to the lowest body of water and stuff and so and it's been doing it for this for eons as the earth has been here and it's always been the same water just continually recycled over and over and over again. But usually when it comes to precipitation, we're just talking because it drives us nuts. You know, if we were just talking earlier, like, hey, it might not rain this week, you know, and, and really when we're talking precipitation, it's mostly just how it affects what we want to do instead of sometimes really realizing that with precipitation comes life. I mean, it's life from the sky, it's fresh water. And they predict like in 20 years that two thirds of the world is not gonna have access to fresh water because just how things are changing in our climate and stuff like that. So really it's manna from the sky and it's what everybody wants and what everybody needs um, because it's, it's magical. I mean, they have done studies and we as human beings, when we're near water, we feel okay. When we're not we're near water, we don't feel okay. And that's why I think it's three quarters of the world lives about, I think it's like within 50 miles of a large body of water, be it a lake or the ocean or whatever it is, rivers, whatever it is. It's like, we need to be near water to feel okay because it's magical. And it's not just that it gives us something that we're drinking, but it's the sight and the sound too, that really it's like, it is magical to us when we just hear that. And even for myself, I have a white noise machine at night and it's raindrops. I just love the sound of just, water running and stuff like that. It makes us feel good when we hear and see water because then we know we're gonna be okay. And then mother nature, you know, she brings it down even like this, like a rainbow where it's, it's water and light working together and stuff like that. And just to think that all this moisture and how it comes down and, and uh, lays down through the trees and then always works its way down to the lowest body of water is how mother nature works it, right? But our challenge has been now is that we were changing our forest environment to cities, to urban environments. And it's happening more and more all the time. You know, where we take forested areas, areas with, with trees and understories and stuff like that and turn it into our urban environment. And really this is what we usually start out with up here in the Pacific Northwest, because we are a temperate rainforest. And a temperate rainforest means there's lots of trees. You know, if you go to the whole river, like where this was taken, um, over there by Forks, you know, where you have those huge cedar trees and fir trees and hemlocks, I mean, monster trees. And then the understory of those trees, uh, 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 dogwoods and vine maples, you know, and then a little bit lower, you have your, your rhododendrons, your azaleas and your ferns and your mosses and all this plant material that is built to intercept the water that's coming down, but built on beautiful soils that have been built up over years and years and years. So really, this is a sustainable environment that nothing has to be added for this environment to be successful just because how the soils and the plant material and the water all work together. So in this environment, which is again, based on beautiful soils been built up with microbes and bacteria and funguses and nematodes, everything that's built up over all this time, which helped break down organic matter and turn it into beautiful soils, there's always this organic matter layer on the top of the soil surface because everything's that comes down from the forest just stays there. So pine cones, 
uh, needles, leaves, flower petals, you know, old trees, branches, everything that just falls to the ground, stays in the ground, and then the microbes turn it into beautiful, beautiful topsoil, you know, just feet and feet of beautiful topsoil. So in this good environment, when water comes over and drops down in through precipitation, it's one, it's intercepted by all this plant material. So this plant material slows that water down and even goes slower and slower as it gets down towards the, um, uh, the, the understory. And then it's allowed to seep into this organic matter and into the topsoil. And then eventually some of it through the subsoil and turn into groundwater. But 50% of the water that comes out of the sky is just returned right back up to the sky through a process called evapotranspiration. And that's evaporation through the um, uh, just, you know, warmth and water moving up again because it's warm. And then transpiration is the water movement from roots up through the plant and out through the leaves. OK, so 50 percent of that water is just moved right back in the atmosphere through this process. And then 35 percent in this beautiful forested area would be detained because it's allowed to slow down. It's allowed to spread out and it's allowed to sink into the really beautiful um, organic matter and topsoil and down to the subsoil into the groundwater. And then maybe 15% of it would be what we call surface water runoff. And mostly that's like with a big storm that comes in, a major amount of water comes out of the sky in a small amount of time. And that whole system right here can't handle that. And so water's just running off that soil surface down, uh, down, down, right? To the lowest body of water because that's how water moves to the lowest body of water. So that's how our forested system it is. Our challenge though is that when we we build our urban environments is that you can't build in all that beautiful soil. And look at this, look at that's beautiful, dark, gorgeous soils that have been, been built up again over eons. I mean, over millennia to have this beautiful soil that all these plants are going in, but it has to be removed because you have to get down to sub uh, soils in order to be able to build on, right? So they take all that away. And you know what they do with all these soils is that they sell them because they're beautiful, beautiful topsoils. They're gorgeous soils. And this is what people want to be able to grow nice plants in. So they sell all that soil, get it down to the subsoils and we build utopia, right? So more houses, more streets, more driveways, more sidewalks. They don't bring any of that good soil back in. Maybe a skiff that they can throw in and then they throw in lawns and trees and stuff like that. And most of the time in our urban environments, our plants really struggle because they don't have good soil. I mean, they're actually just trying to grow on hard pan. Very, very difficult. So now we can have this environment where very little is going back up in evapotranspiration because we don't have this huge canopy of, of plant life. Very little is, is detained because we don't have all that plant material slowing it down. And so we have a very small layer of topsoil with no organic matter on top of it. And these soils even are like really depleted of all the life that really is the, the driver of, of having beautiful soils is all that life in the soil because it's just, you know, they're just substandard soils. And now they predict or they, they say 50 to 55 to 70 percent is surface water runoff, which now becomes a problem because of all the things it carries with it, including pesticides and things from our vehicles and everything else. So now it's a big problem. OK, so because of how we've. Um, built urban environments, we've really created two extremes now, and this is what we're seeing, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight with how water works, okay? So the first one is stormwater runoff, and first of all, I got to apologize. I could not find any slides for like the Snohomish County that had just like this good visual of showing how really things are changing for us in our storm patterns in the Pacific Northwest, where we're seeing, you know, the, the gray here is our normal amount of water through the months, and this blue is what we're seeing now. So we are seeing more water coming out of the sky during the winter time, fall and winter, and almost every year now. But we're also seeing less water during our spring and summer times. Just like we just got out of here, like uh, those two weeks in April were absolutely gorgeous weather, 70. We hit 80, I think, one day and stuff like that, but very abnormal. When I checked the water the other day, we had um, before this little storm that came in over um, uh, the weekend, we had a quarter inch of rain that had come out of the sky when regularly this time of year, we have two inches and a quarter inch of rain, okay? Two and a quarter inches of rain. So we're really running a two inch deficit in April in our soils already, which is kind of a big deal, okay? But we're seeing this all the time. More moisture coming out of the sky in the winter, less moisture coming out in the summertime, okay? And realize too that, you know, we have two systems that handle our waters in our urban environments. 
One is the, you know, the sewer pipes that, um, or some people are on septic, but that water just, in the sewer pipes, it goes all our wastewater from uh, toilets, kitchens, you know, bathrooms, everything else goes into a pipe, underground pipe, goes to the um, wastewater treatment plant. They clean it all up and then they put it back into uh, the environment as clean water. But we also have these storm water systems, which are in all our streets, right? They're just those grates that you see. They usually have like a fish on them and say, hey, I'm down here, you know, but it's just telling you that this is not treated water. All it is is collection of water in our urban environment down to the lowest body of water. So all it needs to do is remove water from our urban environment so we don't have flooding or big problems, but it's not treating water. And that can be our challenge, okay? Because we have so much going on and so much impervious um, that I, we saw this just the other day where we go like a couple weeks with, with no rain. And as soon as we get a big rain, now you see the oils and the greases and everything else coming from all of our vehicles that are going straight into these stormwater drains, you know? But then that's, that's one thing we can see, but they're also carrying things we can't see. And a lot of those are pesticides. Um, I did, uh, probably about 10 years ago, we did a natural yard care event in um, Renton. And they asked 12 neighbors in one block to uh, bring us all their old mowers and uh, stuff like that. And they gave them a brand new mulching mower. This is you know, back when everyone had money. Gave brand new mulching mowers, gave them weed pullers, gave them organic fertilizers. And in exchange, they said, can you give us, give us any pesticides that you have? And this is what 12 people had in their garages for pesticides. I mean, this huge pile of weed killers, insect killers, fungus killers, mite killers, all these killers that are pesticides because a side means to kill. So to kill a pest, where in um, horticulture, again, we try to kill insects, we try to kill funguses, we try to kill weeds, we try to kill uh, slugs and snails, we try to kill little furry creatures. So we have all these killers that we have in our, that we can go down and just buy at any store um, to, to kill all these organisms. And what they found is that in our waters too, is that there's 23 different pesticides flowing through all our rivers and streams in the Pacific Northwest, including 100% diazinon when it was being sold, was in 100% of um, all the rivers and streams. And also these weed killers up here, 2,4-D, MCPP, those are the big weed and feed uh, products. And they're finding that in every body of water that we have around here. So that's what's being run off along with all those other things into our stormwater system. So now what we've done is we have beautiful water, water from the sky, what water that people are going to be begging for in the future to just have fresh water. Do them, we'll do rain dances to have water again and stuff like that. You run it through our urban system and now it's storm water. Okay. So it's the same thing. Now it's just picking up a bunch of stuff and it's a problem. A problem enough that it's the number one pollution uh, uh, problem in the Puget Sound. The Department of Ecology estimates 50 million pounds of toxins every year flow into the Puget Sound just from water movement through our environment. So big, huge problem, okay? So the second problem is our drought conditions that we're seeing again. So like in 2015, we had the hottest month on record where we hit 10 days of 90 degrees. 2017, we set a record with 55 days of no water, completely no water, shattered the record because usually around here, it's like about, it was like 40 days or something like that, but 55 days and again, it's in the summertime. All these are in the summertime when not only do we have lack of water, but we also have higher temperatures. Um, so those higher temperatures really drive a lot of our water use. And in 2015, you know, Seattle, Everett, and Tacoma had to call their um, contingency plan to say, hey, we need people to, um, to, uh, to relax how much water they're using and stuff like that so we can conserve what we have so there's enough for everybody, right? There's always a limited amount. All the time, our water sources are replenished every year through our snowpacks. And like in the city of Everett, 75% of the water um, is from uh, the, the Spada Lake res Reservoir. So, you know, a couple areas hold all of our water and then we start using it during the summertime. So in that year, they actually asked, you know, they have these voluntary tips for reducing water use. Like, you know, hey, don't water, uh, don't uh, wash your car, you know, or if you're gonna do it, do it on your lawn. So it kind of waters your lawn kind of thing, you know, just kind of really thinking about conserving water. And they asked for a 10% water reduction, but a strong emphasis was on landscaping, you know, let your lawn go dormant, reduce the amount of water you're using in your landscape, and which is really good tips. And really, you know, the landscape is something that we can reduce on. But when we had the heat that we had those years, 
um, if the landscapes weren't set up for it, you know, that's like, that's like telling somebody, Hey, tomorrow you're running a marathon, you know, and you've never trained for it. I mean, all of a sudden you're in big trouble. If you're going to have to go those 26 miles, no matter what. And all these plants had to do that, right. They had to get to the end of the summer with now no water when there's, when their system and their soils were not set up at that point to not have any more water in the system. So this is what we were seeing out there that we saw plants that were getting fried, literally fried because the amount of heat they were getting on like the Southern exposure and limited soil and limited um, moisture so that they are, they're just, you know, they're just literally dying out there. And this one, the rhododendron, it still looks like it's green, but really in horticultural terms, we call this past wilting point. And that means that even if you water this soil now down below, the plants could still gonna die. Its roots have been so damaged now that even if it gets moisture, it doesn't have the ability to rehydrate itself and to live. So most plants, when they're under drought stress, they kind of lower their leaves, right? They kind of lower their leaves because for them, that means that they are, they're lowering the, the air movement over their leaves, which means that they're having water um, evaporated from the transpiration. So they're just kind of trying to conserve their moisture by lowering their leaves and stuff. And then evergreens like pines and junipers and everything, they're really set up to like be really major water conserving. So their whole tissues are made so they do not lose water as much as possible. And that's why they live under very difficult conditions. But most of our landscape plants need water. And when they don't get it, this is what's gonna happen. And then we saw soils like this, literally so dry, literally so dry, they were cracking. The clay was just splitting itself apart and almost becoming hydrophobic, okay? And then what we saw because of this is that we saw a lot more insect and disease problems because plants under stress with not having moisture means that now they are starting to give off different energy levels, almost vibrations and stuff like that. And insects key in on this. And so we're seeing, oops, excuse me. So we are seeing challenges like with birch trees and birch trees still have a big problem with this bronze um, birch bore where this is what the holes look like. A lot of times the birches will have round holes on them and that sap sucker is doing their job. But if you have holes where it has this level top on the top of it, so it's almost like a half a circle going on, that's the bronze birch bore. And what happens is that the birch tree does not have enough moisture going up through its, its system so that when the insect tries to bore through it, most trees have enough pressure inside with their sap that if something penetrates their bark, if that sap pushes them out so they cannot penetrate it. The problem is without enough sap flow, without enough pressure, without enough moisture, these little um, uh, bores go straight in, straight down to the cambium and start eating that living tissue and the tree's gonna start dying from the top down. So if you have birch trees, look at your birch trees up high, you will start seeing limbs and the top start to die back and it's because they're not getting moisture. So they have to have moisture in our summer times or they will be in big trouble. And then we also saw plants, this is called verticillium wilt, and it showed itself in summertime, but it's really a winter problem where our soils are so saturated that the roots actually are just rotting off in the ground. And then in summertime, when they need those roots in order to be able to pull in water, those roots are so damaged, they can't do it. And then we have flagging and that's like whole branches dying off. So big problems with having plants go into drought stress when they're not prepared for it. Lace bugs have been tenacious on rhododendrons and azaleas. And if you look underneath the leaves, like this is what it looks like on top and the leaves just do not look good. But if you flip them over, this is what you'll see is probably uh, the lace bugs in abundance, really small. And then all this black stuff is their fecal matter. Um, but the lace bugs have really hit rhododendrons and azaleas and it's a drought stress response. If the, if the plants under, aren't under drought stress, no problems with lace bug. If they're under drought stress, lace bugs attack them heavy. And then aphids, probably everyone sees aphids. And that's because aphids really are a unique insect in the fact that um, there's an, an aphid for almost every plant. So if you have aphids, like this is on roses, right? Aphids on your roses will not go over to broccoli, let's say, but broccoli has an aphid that's specific for broccoli and stuff. So there's aphids for all the plants in the world, but they explode with their populations in springtime. And if plants are under drought stress, they really take over because they can do a lot more damage. And like, you know, within a couple of weeks, you just see aphid populations completely engulfing a lot of our plants. And the reason this happens is that when the eggs hatch in springtime, they come out as a live female insect, okay? So they don't have to go in through instars. They're actually a live female insect that is giving birth in seven to 10 days with 100 babies 
that were inside of her that each have a hundred babies inside them that are all females. So they just every seven to 10 days are pumping out a new hundred generation family of aphids. And that's like within two or three weeks, you'll just see your plants explode. So they do this all year long. And then in fall time, they'll give birth to males in order to be able to do that male female thing in order to lay eggs for the next winter. But all through spring and summer, it's nothing but females having a good time with their, their children and their grandchildren and great grandchildren and great, 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 great grandchildren while they're sucking the juices out of our leaves and causing damage. But the stuff that comes out the back end of aphids is called honeydew, okay? And a lot of insects like that honeydew, including ants. And ants will protect, herd, and also and make sure that predators can't get to the aphids in order to get this honeydew. Like this ant right here is getting the honeydew straight from the source. It's not even waiting for it to drop on the ground and just taking like a big slurpy machine, just sucking it dry and stuff like that. So they will actually have insects protect them for this honeydew. So all these problems were caused by drought stress, okay? So went over that pretty quick, but storm water is a problem for us. We have too much water in the um, winter time. And then what we're seeing now is that we're seeing longer extended periods of time in the um, uh, summer, like, like again, like this one started in April where we have less water coming out. So we really under a lot of stress, winter and summer with some of our plants, especially in poor soils. And that's why healthy soils really are the whole key. And I'm gonna talk about that next. And first of all, again, you know, there's this pamphlet on the um, uh, Snohomish County website, the healthy soils and tremendous, tremendous amount of information in here and resources and stuff like that to really to help you understand about the beauty and why we want to create healthy soil. So uh, get this healthy soil PDF um, off of the Snohomish County website also, but fantastic information because I've just got a little bit to talk about here, um, but uh, more information on how to make your soils better, okay? But they really are mother nature's difference maker because again, you like that, that forced picture I showed you when you have soil that, that uh, deep and that dark and rich, plants thrive, okay? So one thing about soils though, is that um, in, small amount of, uh, in small amounts, they really can make huge differences. And this research that they did at WSU back um, going on in 2014 now is when uh, the Seattle Times wrote this article, is that uh, WSU is trying to see how storm water um, reacted with our, our, our fish, with our salmon, because they're so important to us, and also how they could try to mitigate that through just having better soils. And so what they did is they had three barrels. Okay, one barrel, they had beautiful, pristine water in it. One barrel, they had storm water runoff from Highway 520. And this is the old Highway 520 before they um, built the new one. And now any water that comes off of that highway goes off of the highway to the land and then it's mitigated through uh, 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 through the soils on the sides, but it's not just dropped straight into Lake Washington like it used to. But they collected that Highway 520 runoff. And so they put high, excuse me, Highway 520 runoff in the second barrel. And in the third barrel, they took that same 520 runoff and they ran it through a small layer of gravel and compost. I think it was like two or three inches of gravel and compost. Same water, poured it through there, put that water in the barrel, okay? And what they did then is watch for the reaction to what the salmon did when they were in that water. And what they found all the time is that the salmon in the fresh water, love and life, having a good time. Salmon um, in the straight 520 runoff, literally almost instantly go into the water, turn upside down, floating to the top. I mean, that kind of a reaction by having those toxins in their environment in that kind of amount. But what they found is that every fish survived in the water that was poured through a small layer of compost and, um, and gravel. So just a small layer of healthy soils is now an environmental cleanser. It'll cleanse the water, it'll slow it down, cleanse it while it passes through it enough that the water that comes out down below is a lot cleaner and better for the environment. So as gardeners, if we can have better soils, if we can really build healthy soils, immediately we are uh, becoming better earth stewards for slowing that water down off of our properties, okay? And then the second thing I wanna talk about was uh, this Atlantic Magazine article where, um, where they have done studies now and they have found that if we have our hands in really good soils, and this is what I'm talking about, dark, look at that, 
dark, rich. You smell it. It smells earthy. You know, it just it crumbles in your hands. I mean, you can just feel that there's life in that soil. Just gardening for 20 minutes with that kind of soil on our hands releases serotonin and makes us feel better. We were meant to garden. We were meant to be in the ground. We were meant to be part of the environment by just, you know, growing food and growing plants and stuff like that. And so by just having our hands in soil makes us better people, okay? So soil, healthy soils make us better people. Healthy soils make a better environment. So if we can concentrate on building healthy soils during our gardening practices, we'll always have, uh, uh, make it better and better and better and we'll be better too because of it, okay? Because what we want to do now in our landscapes as much as possible is start having better topsoils down below and a good amount of it. If we have six to eight to nine inches of a good soil, you're really gonna see your plants explode. And then we also wanna have this organic matter layer on top of it, just like mother nature does. She never has any bare soil, especially in the Pacific Northwest because of how our moisture runs down and runs over it and runs away. So there's always an organic matter layer on top of our topsoils. And we call that in gardening practices, mulch. Okay, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but everyone should be mulching. You should never have ever have bare soils. It's either covered with plants are covered with mulch, okay? Whoop. Because this is what we do when we have uh, uh, a good soils and mulch immediately. This is usually what you see with our, our urban soils. It's almost like a, a gray, you know, we call it caliche clay. I mean, it's just, it's really not, it's, it's subsoils. It's not really good soils, it's a subsoil. And so we, we have plants, you can see that again, you know, still plants, it'll grow in it. It's got flowers, the senior. You see the little pepper plant right here? It's like, yep, it'll still do okay. But look what happens when we can add a little bit of compost as an amendment. And amending with compost means that we're adding it to the soil before we plant, okay? So we can amend um, before planting as much as possible. If you have some existing plants, sometimes you can just dig those plants up, move them to the side, amend all that rest of the soil with good compost, and then replant. It's easy to do. Um, but when we can amend beforehand, so we have that compost all in our soil. It makes bad soils good immediately. We're, excuse me, look at these plants. Look at these zinnias right here. Twice, three times as many flowers. And look at these pepper plants. It's like five times the size and it has flowers and fruit all over it compared to this little guy. So yes, plants will survive in these types of soils. We want plants to thrive. You want your plants to explode, which means they're happy, which means they're not gonna have any insect or disease problems because they are happy, healthy plants just doing their thing out there. So the only difference between these plants and these plants is that they put compost in and they mulch the soil afterwards to conserve the moisture and make the, uh, the roots happier, okay? So mulch and compost, and you're gonna hear that a lot as we're talking good watering is that we constantly have to be working on composting and mulching, building up healthy soils, okay? So I talked about the big picture, talked about a little bit about healthy soils, showed you the uh, the pamphlet on healthy soils. So really look at that because there's a lot more information in there about good planting and buying compost and stuff like that, great resources and stuff like that. I'm gonna talk about smart water practices now. And there's actually, you know, a really good pamphlet on the, um, uh, on the website too about uh, smart watering and stuff like that. So even more information about, you know, talking about uh, soaker hoses and water wands and when and hows. And it's really interesting. Um, I was telling the ladies when, uh, before we came on that the questions that, that you guys had sent off, which are fantastic, but this is what we hear all the time. It's almost like a water spigot itself, where as soon as we get some dry weather, boom, everyone starts asking, what's the best time of day to, to water? How do I keep from overwatering my, my plants? Um, uh, dealing with summer drought, how often to water and how much? How much water my plants and grass really need? I mean, it's really interesting how these questions start coming out. It's just like, how do I do good watering? So know that I'm going to give you a lot of tips tonight, go over a lot of things, but really watering is you're just learning as you're going more. We've kind of just got to a point where we thought we'd just turn on sprinklers and stuff, but really it's understanding what the water's doing below the soil and how it's affecting things is really what we need to concentrate on, okay? So I'm gonna talk about the smart water practices. First, how to reduce storm water runoff on our properties um, by just being better gardeners. And then also I'll talk about how to use water correctly, how to really be good stewards of using water so we can get the maximum um, results from using our water without overwatering, okay? And wasting water, 
So first of all, the whole key with stormwater is allowing it to spread out the water when it comes down, allowing the water to, I mean, excuse me, allowing the water to slow down, allowing that water to spread out and allow that water to sink in. And again, even with a small layer of good soils, that water sinking in and going through those soils means that the water is cleaner when it comes out the back end, okay? So here's all the steps. Here's four things that, um, that we go over when we're talking about stormwater management when it comes to like um, uh, landscaping, okay? And first one, surprise, surprise, using compost and mulch to reduce erosion, help rain soak in, okay? So went over it a couple of times, kind of talked about it with healthy soils, but it's really something that we need to keep in mind. Am I, do I have, can I add some compost? Is everything mulch? Do I need to mulch? How am I do working my soil surface so that I'm reducing any um, bare soil by covering it up, okay? And again, if we can amend before we plant, the results are amazing. Um, we can mulch on top just like mother nature does and the soils and the soil organisms start building it into good soils. But if we can add compost in before we plant, we get the results we're looking for in a much quicker time. And here's some studies they did at the Center for Urban Horticulture, where here's a lawn that they planted on our regular glacier till. And you can see after a short period of time, it's coming <clears throat> out, it's getting um, uh, weedy, it's getting moss growing in here. And this lawn down here is green and lush and thick and vigorous growing. It's a beautiful lawn. The only difference is, is that they add compost to this soil before they plant it instead of just planting straight on what our regular glacier, glacier till is. Um, and the whole thing about this experiment was to see how water reacted with these two environments. So they put water up on the top and then it came down and they collected it at the bottom down here on both of these. You can see the collection units down here on both of them. And what they found by just having a nicer lawn, just by having a greener lawn, just by having a thicker, more vigorous growing lawn, reduce, reduce stormwater reduction 50% immediately. Immediately we reduce stormwater runoff and immediately we have a, we have a nicer lawn. So was there a question, Karen? Yeah, Lad. Yeah. Um, uh, the question is, does landscape fabric to control weeds and grass count as mulch? No, and I do not, I, and, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up, but that's a great question. I do not like the landscape fabrics. Um, the concept of laying something down and putting something on top makes sense in you know just a, uh, a logical sense, but the fabrics being a plastic, those little pores that they have, they get clogged up. And then we almost form an impervious layer that water cannot get through in that. And I've seen soils when that fabric was pulled up, completely bone dry, hydrophobic underneath, and the plants were dying off. So I never recommend the landscape fabrics. If we wanna place something over like existing weeds or the soil before we put a mulch down, I recommend newspaper or cardboard. They make really good um, physical barriers before we put the mulch, but you always wanna put an organic layer of, of some type of material um, or the composted bark, grass clippings, leaves, arbor's chips. I'll talk about those here in a little bit too and stuff, but you always wanna have an organic layer, an organic matter layer on top of that. Um, so the fabric would not be considered a mulch in itself. And I just recommend don't buy them, don't buy them. They, we call them future work for gardeners by tearing up all that old weed fabric. So uh, most people are gonna pay some money to have someone do that, so it's a pain in the butt. Any others, Karen? No, no, so no good. We're still rocking. Okay, so like I said, if you can amend, that's the best thing, right? If you can amend, if you can add it beforehand, then you're gonna get those results a lot quicker. But mother nature has set this up in such a beautiful way that she makes beautiful soils all the time just by doing her thing and gravity, laying things down on top of the soil surface. And again, that's called mulching, right? That organic layer that's on top of all the soils in our forest and stuff like that would be considered an organic mulch, okay? So that's just how mother nature does. And then all the little soil organisms come up and they pull the stuff down and they just over time just make it better and better and better and better. And that's what we want to create. So if you have an existing landscape and you don't want to dig it out, mulching is the best thing to do. Again, we are trying to recreate this nice thick layer of organic matter over our soils in order to protect the roots of the plants and also help the water slow down and sink into our topsoils, okay? Just like mother nature does, you don't see any bare soil out here and really, when you look at weeds in our environment, moss in our environments like that, 
when we have these growing in our landscapes is because mother nature is trying to protect her soils. Those things are trying to protect her soils from being washed away because she understands how harsh the rains can be around here sometimes. So all these things like the moss growing on the plants and everything, these are just, they're like a big sponge that lets that water soak in, slowly releasing it to the environment, okay? So we want to recreate that environment of just leaving material on top of the soil surface at all times. So really the, the key to any successful garden, any successful garden is this constant renewal of organic matter like mother nature does it. Falls in the leaf time, in the fall, I mean, excuse me, in the fall time, leaves come down and by the time spring comes around, they're already breaking up and turning into beautiful soil. But mother nature is constantly putting things on the soil surface to be broken down by the organisms to make the soil better below. So really it becomes our jobs now as gardeners to be this renewer of organic matter on our soils, okay? Leaves, compost, arbors, chips, whatever we can do. Uh, Ann Lovejoy used to call her pruning chop and drop. She'd prune a branch, she'd chop into little teeny pieces and just drop it straight on the ground below her, constantly adding to that organic matter stuff. The smaller the pieces, the faster it breaks down, okay? So these are the best things about mulch. I mean, these are the, uh, the uh, positive characteristics about using mulch, mulch though, is that, for us in summertime, it really reduces the evaporation in our soils um, because it's adding a layer to kind of slow it down, but it's also moderating the soil temperatures in, in summer and in winter. And Cisco Morris said one time that I heard that if, this, if the uh, air temperature is 90 degrees and someone has a three inch layer of mulch on their soils, the soil temperatures will be 75 degrees still. And that is a huge difference for just positive plant growth where your roots are 75 or when your roots are 90 degrees and really struggling. And then in the winter time, a mulch makes it so the temperatures don't get that cold and the temperatures stay warmer in there, which makes your roots happier. So it really does well on moderating our temperatures. And that's how mother nature does it, right? Puts a, a layer of organic matter over the, the roots in fall time with all those leaves coming down and all the needles coming down. And those protect it through the winter term the temperatures and then turn into good soils, okay? And really for us in the Pacific Northwest, they are essential for protecting our soils versus all of our really hard rains that come down in the winter time. We need to slow that water down and that's what mulches will do. And if you do it right, it's a great, it's your number one weed control. It's your number one physical weed control other than just having massive amount of plants to help compete against weeds. Um, but mulches are the number one physical weed control. So you want them at least three inches deep though for weed control, okay? So and I'll talk about that with some of the mulches. So, but if you want it for weed control too, you've got to have a thick mulch, okay? So my two favorite ones though, I love arborist chips. They're free, you can move them around. They're really kind of light so you can move them around in wheelbarrows and put them in areas to get your um, weed barrier three or four inches quickly. Arborist chips are the easiest ones. And then leaves, I love leaves. In fall time, when I'm giving talks, I tell everybody this year, keep all the leaves on your property. Don't rake them up and then pay someone to haul them away and stuff like that. Keep them on your property. Kick them off your lawn because it'll kill the lawn if they're allowed to, to be heavy on there, but leave them in all your beds. Put them around your perennials, put them around your shrubs. Even in fall time, they'll be a big, thick layer, but in springtime, they're really light. You peel them up. You'll see the soil underneath those leaves darker because of tannins coming down, but you also see the soil surface all crumbly because the soil organisms are starting to do their work. Absolutely amazing what you'll find if you leave the leaves on the ground. So this fall, leave your leaves, okay? But arborist chips, for a quick and easy mulch that you want to put down, arborist chips are probably the best thing to do. These are all the chips that come from, these are all the plant material that comes from the tree companies that when they uh, thin or take down trees, they run it through a, a chipping machine and it gives them all these what they call arborist chips. And around here, what's wonderful about them is that they have greens and browns in them because you know they might be pruning in the summer with leaves or they're pruning in the winter when they still have uh, uh, some of the greens from the cedars and firs and stuff like that. But by having greens and then having your browns, which is your carbon, it actually makes compost. So by adding the two together, Arborist chips are actually creating soils quicker because it's mini compost machine on top of your soil surfaces. So if you want to get um, arborist chips <coughs> quick and easy, whoops, excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water. Uh, this is the website right here, www.getchipdrop.com. They will hook you up 
with tree companies that are in your neighborhood. So you can get them pretty quickly. Now, if you give them a couple bucks, like I heard if you give them $20, you go straight to the top of the list and you'll get, you'll get chips as faster than anybody else. But if you don't get money, you still get them for free. No, with this drop is that it could be two yards or it could be up to 15 yards. Okay. So they drop what they have in their trucks. It's not like a, um, you calling up and going, can I get one and a half yards of your finest material put in my little teeny tarp right here? It's like, you're getting them for free. They're doing it as a courtesy. And so you're going to get what they have. So if you get a large amount, just means you might have to share with your friends or sell them, you know, sell them to your neighbors if you get a big pile, right? Hello. The I have a couple questions. Okay. Let's um, go. Will Douglas fir needles falling on your yard create a more acid environment as a natural yes. mulch? Yep. Yes, it will. Same with the cedar um, uh, needles and, and stuff like that. They do create more of an acidic environment in our, uh, in our area and stuff. Also, acidity is created from water moving through our soils leaching out the minerals and by those minerals being leached out makes the soils a little more acidic. Um, but a lot of our plants like growing in acidic. So if you're growing a Northwest garden with ferns and some natives and stuff, really you want to leave those needles down. And another question about that, um, they're uh, asking about cedar chips. Um, doesn't cedar impede um, germination? Well, if you're going to have cedar chips, like they, okay, I guess we have, might have two different things here. Arborist chips would be the greens and the browns from the chipping. Cedar chips, like they use for uh, playgrounds and stuff like that, is literally just chopped up inside wood. It's not bark or anything like that. It's just the wood. So there is no greens, and that's why they stay there for a long time, because it's not doing anything. There's nothing to break it down. I mean, it break down over a long time with some carbon, I mean, with some nitrogen added to it, but it won't do it just over a long time. So um, uh, so if you're gonna be planting seeds, you would not be putting big layers of mulch down. Using mulch or put down existing plantings. Um, so if you're gonna do some plantings, don't use cedar chips either for a mulch. Uh, yeah. It's just too heavy of a, a woody material. Okay, um, two more. Um, a follow up to that is, um, but she wants to know, um, won't the arborist be bringing cedar chips? So uh, arborists, yeah, cedar chips in arborist chips, will they prevent germination? So cedar, it, it depends on what the people are, are cutting down, right? I yeah. mean, if they're just um, cutting down big leaf maples, there's no cedar in there, you know? So it all, you might, you probably can ask on that get drop um, website if what they're cutting down, but it all depends on the plants that they're cutting. And if they're cutting down some cedars with some other trees, I've never seen any problems. I've never seen any problems with it. I mean, if, if you, if anyone gets arborist chips, you will see the pile, let me go back. It'll be a pile like this and it kind of, you know, it's like fresh and stuff like that. And it might even be a little steamy because it has the greens and the browns and stuff. And there might be cedar in there, fir, hemlock, maple. There's gonna be some wood in there, but it has all those greens too. You can see like, you know, they're kind of chunky like this. So it makes a good thick mulch but after a while, it breaks down and it looks like this. It looks like it's turning into soil. And that's what we want. We want the acceleration through the greens and the browns from the arborist chips to grow. They will not cause any problems in your soil. And again, unless you're piling them high for germination, they can cause some problems. But if you have little plants out there, never seen any problem with arborist chips. As a matter of fact, as an aside, I talked to a guy from the University of Washington and they were doing studies where they were adding arborist chips to their holes when they were doing plantings like out in the mountains when they couldn't water the trees in and stuff like that. So all they did was dig a hole, put the tree in and cover it with soil. They found if they put arborist chips in with that soil, they had better water conservation and they got like three times the amount of transplant success. So nothing goes bad by adding arborist chips. And, and one more. Um, how can you be sure you're, you don't get arbor chips from diseased trees? Another great question. Plant disease. Yep, and another great question. Um, first of all, and I'm glad you brought this up because I didn't mention it, you'll always want to tell them you want a clean load, okay? A clean load means that there's no ivy, uh, blackberry, or holly, okay? Because those are invasives. You don't want to bring that in. So you tell them a clean load. They understand that. They will not bring you with any of those things in. Um, 
But there's been many studies done now, and they have found that even if a plant is diseased when it's cut down, and if it's run through a shredder, if it's part of an arborist chip, like it again has greens and browns, right? It has so many different kinds of different bacteria and funguses in there that they have found that disease is not spread from a plant being diseased when they cut it down to adding arborist chips to a landscape. That there, that was the thought for many, many years that you wouldn't want to bring a tree that had verticillium wilt or phytophthora or anything like that. But they have found now that because there's such a dynamic um, uh, flora of bacteria and funguses and all these things going on that those diseases don't go in there and all of a sudden just start attacking the new plants. Um, so that was a, a, an old uh, thought, but if you look at any new arboreal research, it shows that that is not a problem. Um, so we shouldn't worry about it. That's it for now. Okay, great questions. Keep them rolling. That is fantastic. I love it. Um, because some of those things I should be saying and I just I sometimes I talk way too fast as you discover. So, <laughs> um, so the key again about fungal based soils is that this is what you're trying to create. You roll a rock over in springtime, you see all the hyphae growing or you have a hyphae growing on your leaves. That is, means that you are developing beautiful soils. They have found that most soils start out bacterial when they're young and as they get older and once they're successful and a sustainable soil like in our rainforest, almost completely fungal base, okay? Almost completely fungal base. So you might see some mushrooms growing in there and stuff like that. It's like all oh, great signs that you're building better soils, okay? So, and one of my favorite funguses, and they have done many studies with this, but mycorrhizae is a phenomenal fungi that forms a symbiotic relationship with roots in order to make plants better. And they feel now that they, can confidently say that because of mycorrhizae is the reason that plants were able to colonize on land because most plants just have a big you know roots coming out with the fine roots and the tips be able to pull in water and moisture but all the other roots are mostly just for anchoring and stuff like that so very difficult as a plant got larger to take in what it needed from just these small root tips and stuff like that so they you know they kind of estimate that all, nearly all the plants um, have a, uh, this relationship with mycorrhizae and that is why they're successful on land. And you go to this website, mycorrhizae.com and it'll blow your mind on just what they've discovered by this one fungus, what it does for plants because it improves nutrient and water uptake, it improved, improves root growth, it improves plant growth and yield in agriculture, it reduces transplant shock, reduces drought stress. I mean, everything is positive by the plants and the roots and mycorrhizae having this symbiotic relationship. You can buy it from mycorrhizae and uh, even in some retail stores, they can be selling it, but I like mycorrhizal products. They are world known about having the finest products around. You add it with water and then you just soak in your plants. So if you're doing some new plantings and it's maybe a new landscape or maybe a, a, like a, a new home and stuff like that, mycorrhizae might not be there. So if you can add the mycorrhizae and you'd be amazed on how much bigger your plants are gonna get. Because what happens again, instead of just the root tip, you know, just like the root tip, like right here is the thing that's bringing in moisture and nutrients, the mycorrhizae actually attach itself with all these hyphae and all these hyphae act then as like little mini roots. So instead of just having your basic root system down here, because of the symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizae, it has like a three times the amount of a root system with everything that the mycorrhizae brings in moisture and nutrition to the plant. And in turn, the plant roots exude sugars to feed the mycorrhizae. So they love growing together. So I highly recommend if you're doing any new plantings, give it some mycorrhizae if you don't think it's there. Okay, so that's a little bit about plants. I'm gonna go through these other ones pretty quick so I can talk about watering. But the next one is like just uh, pavement options that we have in our landscapes. You wanna use permeal hardscapes now as much as possible. So that there's like, you know, gaps where the water can move through into gravel. Um, they still make beautiful driveways, sidewalks and stuff like that. This is when we built in um, Seattle where all the water that was collected went into their rain garden down through here. So it can be used that way too. They now have pervious concrete where water moves through the concrete and even paver patterns. You know, we have these like little holes with the gravel so that water just doesn't, it's just not a impervious surface that water moves over. It's allowed to uh, slow that water down, okay? And the next one is uh, using plants in order to protect streams and native areas from stormwater runoff. 
Um, Cause again, in the big picture, they are uh, essential for interception, right? So plants, if we have a nice huge planting out there, they slow the water down just from water hitting their foliage and stuff. So for most of our gardens, we really should have our goal to have either massive amounts of plants and huge community of plants with little or no soil uh, uh, being exposed or mulching those areas if we have bare soil, okay? And then really the most important plant are trees in the uh, landscape to plant those correctly, especially if we can do, if we have the room to plant evergreens, you know, um, because they work year round, whereas our deciduous trees, the leaves uh, don't slow down water during the winter time. Uh, and then plant in layers and in evergreens as you can um, to get uh, a better garden and also get more wildlife into your yard. So we're gonna talk about watering now. Let me talk about trees, because again, they are so important. We really have to take care of them. And if we're going to have uh, drought conditions, even if you're not gonna water a lot of your plants, like you know, if you have some perennials die, you can replace them and stuff. But if trees have problems, then it's usually uh, very expensive to replace or they have a lot of insect or disease problems. But with trees nowadays, you have to understand that even if you're gonna let your lawn go dormant, you have to water for your trees. If there's a tree in the lawn, you're gonna have to water your lawn. Even if you don't wanna water your lawn, you've got to water it for the tree, okay? And we have to water in our drip lines of the trees too. I know a lot of people, they're just constantly trying, you know, like when the plant was small, they watered around here, but realizing as the plant gets larger, its active root system is right below the drip line, we call it. And that's really like right at the edge of the canopy of the tree where anything that's dripping down, we call it the drip line, any moisture that comes down, it would work its way down to this drip line. So this is where the active roots are at, is right below this drip line on both sides. And that's what needs to be watered. So if you don't want to, you don't water this area, but you gotta water the drip line and a couple feet inside and outside of that, okay? And again, plant in layers, because the more plants we have, the soil stays um, uh, uh, cooler and also stays uh, uh, more moist because of having that shady condition. And you look at two, if you have a ground layer and then shrubs and then an understory and an overstory, just like mother nature does in the forest, right? These would be the big conifers. These would be the uh, vine maples and the dogwoods. These would be like the shrubs and the roadies. And then you'd have your mosses and ferns and everything, just like she does it. If you do that, look at all the different wildlife you bring in from these different layers. So not only are you building a better garden by planting layers, you're also bringing in better wildlife because that's how they like to live in these layers, okay? And if any of us live near a body of water um, and we can see it, please, no more lawns down in that body of water. We need to plant a layer or a, an area of planting material because these roots are a lot better at taking in any toxins from that moisture. It'll slow down the water, allow it to sink in before it gets down to the body of water, okay? And natives, I think Emily talked about um, natives earlier. Um, I just want to go over two here, two of my favorites. I love sword ferns and I love vine maples. Sword ferns, and both these plants do good in our tough urban environments, so they don't have to have great soil to do okay. And in good soils, they explode. But if I have an area that I'm not sure what to do with it, I put a little vine maple and then I plant three sword ferns around it and then just let it become a little forest and stuff like that. Sword ferns stay green year round, so they always slow the water down. And they also are a great weed control because the weeds don't grow very well under this canopy of all those fronds. So I love sword ferns in all my uh, bare areas. And then vine maples are a deciduous tree, so they lose their leaves and get this great fall color. But in springtime, they have a little inconspicuous flower that comes out that in um, when the hummingbirds are migrating from Mexico to Canada, these little flowers come out right when those birds are coming into Washington. So it's like a little gas station and they refuel be heading off before heading off to Canada. So if you plant vine maples, and I probably have like 20 of them in my house, I have hummingbirds all over my yard by just planting vine maples. So two really good native plants. If you're just getting, you know, just need to uh, do some corners or do some spots that are tough to plant with anything else, use these guys and you'll have a very successful little planting, okay? And again, cover up the ground with ground covers. I like tall ones. I like ground covers 18 inches or taller because anything really small gets a lot of weeds, but they shade the ground, they protect the soil during winter time. And again, it also shades the ground so that the soil stays, it's like a natural mulch when they shade the ground and keep the soil moisture, okay? So that's just a little bit on plants. And then I'm just gonna talk a couple slides about rain gardens. And um, April had talked about the rain garden uh, program this Thursday. So there's more information about that if you want to check that out. But 
really in the Pacific Northwest to have an area where you can pull water from and then uh, let it disperse into your landscape is a fantastic thing to do. This is a rain garden that we built in Seattle that was actually showcased in Sunset Magazine. The water came down, you can't see it from the downspout here, and then all the water moved down here and it all watered all these plants. So this was a really beat up landscape that became a beautiful uh, little oasis and all the water stayed on their landscape. So they completely took themselves off the stormwater system of their downspouts. You know, and if you do a rain garden, you know, the basics are is that you have water come in, stormwater, you have plants that like drier conditions up here, you have really good amended soil down here, and then you have plants down here that like it a little moisture, and the, the rain garden can fill up, and then as it dries out, all that water goes down through the good soil and is completely filtered out. And there's always an overflow just because we had some real bad storms where the water can just move somewhere else without causing problems. But there's great information about um, Rain Gardens on the RainWise uh, uh, website. Just Google up RainWise and get some information there about you know planting lists, maintaining them, building them, and stuff like that. And also check out that program on Thursday. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna yes. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. I have heard you should cut sword ferns to the ground in February. Um, that's what you heard, huh? <laughs> You know, I'll say, uh, I'm, so I'll tell you that this is something that me and my wife both do is that I want to leave all the sword, sword fern fronds because they just look a little ratty, but they take up space and they cover the soil and I don't have much weeding to do. But my wife really likes to look where she cuts off all those old fronds like in February. And then you have all those new little fiddleheads come out and it's beautiful, fresh, lush fern fronds coming out. So either way works. I'm a lazy guy, so I don't want to spend all those time cutting off all those fun fern fronds. The new ones grow up. They've done it for millennia, right? They grow up through the old fern stuff. They look beautiful in spring. They, they harden themselves off and they have a beautiful canopy all the time. Um, it's just whether you want to put that time into the maintenance or whether you like that fresh look of the old fern fronds. But I will guarantee you, if you leave those fern fronds, you will not do any weeding around those plants. So. I like the lazy garden, so I leave the fern fronds and I cut down on my weeding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Awesome. Okay, so smart watering. Again, when we're talking about watering, it's all with design, with conservation in, in mind. So first thing about water conservation, building better soils with composted mulch. I can't hammer it anymore, but we always have to be working on our soils, building up our healthy soils, and everything else starts taking care of itself. But you also want to plant plants according to their water needs and lawns because they're such big water users. And if you have a, to have a successful lawn, and I'll talk about lawns here in a minute, you need to water if it's getting really dry to reduce that amount of water is a key. OK, because if we're in charge of the water, we got to be responsible. I mean, my gosh, it's beautiful, lush water. I mean, beautiful water that comes out of every spigot that, you know, the, the water providers don't say, oh, here's bad water for your lawn and good water for your showers. It's all good water. So to be able to do this and have all this go down, one thing is that water is very inexpensive to buy. And so people can do this and go, oh, it just cost me a couple bucks because of how cheap it is or something like that. But it's very irresponsible, OK? Because like one acre of, of uh, let's say, lawn, if you're going to water one inch of water, and that's what our recommendation is, and I'll talk, about, talk to you about that here, one inch is what we want to kind of figure out how much comes out of our sprinkler. If you're going to water one inch of, of water over uh, one acre, that's over 27,000 gallons of water to get that one inch. And just an aside, got this little water bottle here, 79 cents for 17 ounces, okay? So 79 cents, 17 ounces, you're going, oh, that's pretty cheap water. And then, you know, I can drink all those all day pretty cheap, but that's actually $5.92 a gallon. And if you were going to charge that for the 27,000 gallons over the acre, it would cost you over $160,000 to water your lawn. Nobody's going to do that, right? So you got to be responsible about watering your lawn and be respectful about how inexpensive it is so that we're taking good care of it instead of just going, oh, it's cheap and I'm just going to waste it. We just can't do that. So you have to measure your, your irrigation system to understand how long it's going to take to get that one inch. And there was a lot of questions that you guys had sent off, like how much to water and when's the best time to water. 
um, how much and how often do I water? How much and how often do I water for my vegetables? How much water for my plants to keep my, and my grass to keep it really green? All of it, it's very difficult for me to tell you 10 minutes, five minutes, an hour. I mean, I can't tell anyone really just a number to tell you how much um, comes out of your irrigation system. You have to be the one to figure out that because every system's different because every, um, er, um, every watering system is different that we use, right? So really it doesn't matter if you're using an oscillator or if you use like one of these um, rain things, you know, that kind of go in a big area and stuff like that, you have to measure your system, okay? So what you do is you put some containers out there. It could be cat food cans, it can be uh, uh, tuna fish cans. You know, when my wife was at home, I used all the good china because it was all the same size. I just laid it out on the lawn. I have an oscillator. I got my oscillator here, man. I love these sprinklers, okay? It's a really a slow watering, but allows that water to sink in as it's going back and forth. So I love that slow watering. You go out, you water for a certain amount of time. Like I watered for one hour, just watered for one hour, went out and measured each one of these cups, came out with a median. And for my yard, I came in with about three quarters of an inch for that one hour. So for me to get my one inch of water, I mean, excuse me, I got a half an inch over that one hour. So for me to get one inch of water, I have to water two hours with my oscillator, okay? But your irrigation system is gonna be different. Your pressure is gonna be different. Your soil is gonna be different. Your slope is gonna be different. So just because I take two hours, you're gonna have to measure your own system. And it's worth your time to measure it because that one inch is really what drives all your other watering uh, questions from there. Okay. So again, if you're going to water for uh, 15 minutes, you get a quarter inch, then you're going to only water for one hour to get your one inch. So it's simple math after you do what your average of what's coming out over a simple over a short period of time. Okay. If you have an irrigation system, then your water is going to come out a lot faster. Okay. With those pop-up heads, sometimes it might only be a minute or two before you get that one inch of water because it's a huge amount of water going out there. So you really need to be even more conscious if you're using any uh, automatic systems uh, or if you're using um, uh, controllers on your irrigation, okay? And if you have an irrigation uh, uh, um, controller, you have to install a rain gauge, right? Because it rains a lot of times uh, during the night here. So if you have your water, your system set up to come at four in the morning so you don't lose pressure during the day, for your showers in the morning and stuff like that, and you don't have a rain sensor, then it's gonna rain at night and then your irrigation system is gonna pop on. So a rain sensor will save people thousands of gallons of water just by turning the system off when there's rain coming out because it just shuts your system down, okay? And for a lot of people, they might not even be able to figure out what how their system works if they have an irrigation controller, but the saveourwater.com has all these downloadable operating manuals for almost every irrigation controller has been so you can really understand how to set your irrigation controller correctly, okay? And if you really want to go back big time, you do water sense, where they're actually now setting up these little um, weather stations where it'll give your information to your computer, which is hooked up to your irrigation system so that if uh, it's hot out that day or if it's cloudy or whatever it is, it runs calculations and will only replace the amount of water that was used through evapotranspiration during that day on your landscape. So anybody who's really into computers and into weather and into the irrigation system, water sense is absolutely amazing. They've found that it can save 20 to 40% of the water when it's used correctly. And using it correctly means that your plants are thriving because they're not getting too much water and we're saving water and saving money. So absolutely amazing if you're gonna do it right, okay? Because- well, I have... Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, do vegetables also need only one inch or are we talking landscape here? How about fruit trees? You know, so great question again. All plants, if we know how much that one inch, if you know how it's coming out, then, then what we need to understand is how deep our soil is, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that here in just a minute with the soil probe, but you really need to know how deep that water is being pulled down into your soil. So for most vegetable gardens, we built up those soils most of the time, right? We're in raised beds or we kind of got some mounds or something like that. So we have a lot better soils. So that one inch would fill up six inches of our soil, okay? So if you can get six inches of soil filled up with one inch of moisture, 
plants are going to thrive. So <clears throat> doesn't doesn't matter if it's vegetables, fruit plants, lawns or whatever it is, how deep is your soil? And then um, how long is it going to take you to get that one inch? OK, but I'll talk a little bit more about how to check for that with the soil probe in, in just a couple more slides here. Um, hey, that's it. Awesome. Thank you very, very, very much, Karen. Um, but again, with most irrigation systems, people turn them on in spring and then just turn them on for the same time for the entire year. It's like they need to be adjusted according to our seasonal adjustments too, in order to be a good water saver, okay? And what they found too, is that if you just water like every day, a little bit, our roots don't have to go down very far because they got the moisture they need right there. Even twice a week, the roots will go down a little bit deeper, but not as deep as we want them to. They have found if you could put that one inch of water on one day of the week, right? So you take uh, a Saturday and you put your, like, let's say for me, my two hours, I'm going to get my one inch. I water that two hours on Saturday and then I don't water until the next Saturday. What happens is that as the soil starts drying out a little bit at the top, the roots will actually go down mining for the water and you'll develop a deeper, more vigorous root system naturally by them going down finding the water. Now, if you have poor soils or there's no water down there, roots will not go into dry soil looking for water. But if moisture is there, it will go down and find it and you'll create root systems for plants to explode. Like this lawn that we have the client with where they have roots nine inches deep in the soil. And look how thick and lush that lawn is. That's what you wanna do. Good soils, fantastic plants on top because the roots are, can take advantage of all that soil and all the moisture that's available. But if you have a soil system like this where it's actually cleachy clay and there's no moisture except for right there, very difficult for any plants to uh, not only survive, but to thrive in that condition, okay? And that's usually what we found in most of our urban soils is that most of our plant roots are staying near the surface because they just, they just can't get down deeper. So you've got to go down and check to see how deep your soil is and how deep your roots are and then <clears throat> gauge your moisture from there, okay? And let me talk about that a little bit more because this is what you want to do. If you're really going to do this right, you pick yourself up a soil probe, okay? I got this one from Stuber's, which is up in uh, downtown Snohomish, the horticultural supply house. You can get them online, but get a good one. Get one that is heavy duty. I believe this is about $80, but it'd be the best gardening tool other than a good pair of sharp pruners that you will ever, ever have, okay? Because the cheap ones will go in the soil and then you twist them and then they just kind of twist and break on themselves. But with a soil probe, you put it down as deep as you can go and then you pull it back out and it's gonna tell you exactly how deep your root system is going down here, how deep your good soil is. And then when you hit like hard pan and it goes like this, you know that that's as far down as your good soil is and then you pull it back up. Now, for some people, you might get a plug that's only coming out a couple inches deep. Then you know you got some challenges ahead with your watering and with your successful plants, right? But if you use this for your vegetable garden where you know you have good soils, and then after you water your one inch and you slide it in there and you pull this back out and you see that you have six inches of soil that's all moist because that water is working it's all the way down and you see your roots going down there, you know you've watered correctly, okay? So whenever you water, you've got to check underneath the soil to see what it did underneath there and how deep it got. And that's, when you need, that's how you know how well you water, okay? So again, if you have a, a poor soil and you're gonna put one inch of water on there and it's only gonna go down two inches, then all the rest of it's gonna run off, right? So everyone's different. And that's why it's tough for me to say two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is. You need to know how long it takes to get one inch of soil, no, I mean, one inch of water, know that that one inch can fill in six inches of soil and then how deep is your soil, okay? So for some people, you might only be watering a half an inch two or three times a week because that's what you have to do to keep the soil in your soil profile um, in order to make your, your plants ha ha happy and then know that you're going to start adding compost on top. In your beds, you're going to start adding mulch and stuff like that to make your soils better down below, okay? So soil pro is a key for understanding what's going on down below and how well you're going to water, okay? So for lawns, again, one inch, one, per, one time per week in good and dry weather will keep your lawn lush and green if you have good soils. If you allow your lawns to go dormant, we call it 
going golden and grass plants will naturally do that with their, um, uh, uh, just the way they're set up, they will go into this dormant state without moisture, but it's a very delicate state because they do not have moisture in it for resiliency and stuff. So if we let our lawns go dormant, we have to have minimal traffic on it because uh, being in that uh, delicate state, we can damage our grass plants and then you'll have to do a complete lawn renovation in fall time because the plants that destroyed. Um, and then if we go more than like three weeks with no moisture, water one inch of uh, moisture at least once a month, once every three weeks, keep the soil in that, that soil profile so that when the rains come in, they just go right down into that soil. The soils do not become hydrophobic, kind of like I was talking about with that, that cracking soil, okay? And we'll see it too, that as soon as the lawn doesn't have moisture in its root systems, it'll start during this golden color where the lawn like underneath trees or maybe lower areas, it, it takes a little bit different, more moisture and those places will, will stay green, okay? And if it goes completely dormant, most lawns can do it for six to eight weeks and they're okay. But if it goes longer than that, the lawns will start thinning out and start dying off and then they'll start cracking. And then you have big problems with like weeds coming in and moss and stuff like that. So if you don't want moss, if you don't want weeds in your lawn, you're gonna have to water throughout the summer months, one inch of moisture per week to keep your lawn growing and moving to keep these critters out of there, okay? Let me talk, I, I got, I think about like we eight or nine more slides. I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but let me talk about drip irrigation here real fast because it's a great way of putting moisture exactly where you want it. Um, but if you're gonna put in a drip system um, onto your landscape, you always have your water source with right here like a valve. You always have to have a backflow preventer because you can never have water coming back up into our water supplies, it can cause us problems. So you always have to have a backflow preventer. You always have to have a pressure regulator because usually the pressure coming out of the faucet is way too much for these little tubes and you'll pop out all your emitters. So you have to have a pressure regulator. You'll have to have a filter so any fines don't come in and get your little emitters clogged up. And then you have your adapter for the tubing and then you have your drip tubing going out to your emitters. But you have to have all those things for having a successful drip system so you don't cause problems in our regular water systems by just uh, having water go back into it, okay? But there's so many different kind of cool heads now, little sprinkler heads like this, mister heads like this, uh, uh, um, heads that just drop water straight where you want it. So you can really uh, localize where you're wanting to water your plants. And then as they get more established, you can move your drip system around. And they even have this really cool stuff called droop, uh, drip, drip, drip line tubing now, where it actually just has all these little knitters all over this, this line. And you just lay that out and all these areas get moisture and stuff. And you just lay out your plants accordingly. So really this is a great way with these little systems of keeping the moisture down by the soil and soaking in without getting much evaporation. Whenever we do water going into the air, like even my oscillator or pop-up heads, by going into the air, we're getting more evaporation because it's having contact with the, with the atmosphere. So by keeping the moisture right here, you save a lot of money, a lot of water I just put it straight on the ground, okay? And then soaker hoses are really popular. Um, they're just made out of recycled tires. So it's a great way to recycle a product. And then they just have it where it just emits like they just sweats, they call it. It sweats out of these little tube holes and stuff like that. So the whole area, when you put it down, becomes moisture around it. So um, I highly recommend if you're gonna use any of these soaker hoses, you put mulch on top of it because being out in the sun can kind of bake them and they can start cracking and deteriorating a lot faster. So you want to mulch over it. You want to check it a lot of times too. Go in and dig around, make sure it's still working correctly and stuff like that. Um, and then you're gonna to have to run your system usually quite a while, quite a amount of time in order to get the moisture to go deep in your soil. So same thing, run it for a certain amount of time, put your soil probe in, find out how deep it went. You might have to water more to get your, soil, your moisture deeper. Now, I do not recommend soaker hoses for vegetable gardening anymore. Because these are old tires, they found now that these leach out some materials that you really don't want in your food and stuff like that. So soaker hoses are great for uh, perennial beds, flower beds, trees, shrubs like that. But we do not recommend them anymore for our vegetable beds because of these uh, toxins that can be leached out of the old tires. Okay, so I'm gonna yeah. finish up. Yes. I got a question. All right. Um, I'd like to pull my grass and have a moss garden. Does this make a suitable ground cover? Uh, moss? Yes. It's they a know. wonderful ground cover. As a matter of fact, there are absolutely beautiful moss gardens. 
um, that I, if people can um, get moss to leave it alone and let it grow in, I love moss gardens. Love it, love it, love it. That's it. Did I, did I answer? It? Okay, did I answer? Okay, yeah, yeah. The moss around here is a really nice plant. It stays soft, you know what I mean? You don't have to fertilize it. You don't have to mow it. And then under big trees and stuff like that, I usually plant ferns, hellebores, bleeding hearts, beautiful, beautiful moss gardens. Okay, so smart watering, when and how, that's what everyone's been waiting for. So if you have a new plant, you always have to water it in. I don't care if you plant your plant in a downpour, water your new plants in. You, I have never, ever lost a plant by putting my hose and actually forming a slurry, like a big sloppy mud pit in the hole, putting my plant in, filling it with soil and more water, and then letting that settle in. Never have lost a plant. You always water, always want to water your plants in. Because even in rain with the canopies, the moisture might not be getting to those new roots. And if they start drying out, you're going to have problems. So when you plant, you always water in. Week one after planting, you're going to have to water daily if there's no rain. I always recommend too, put some mulch around those new plantings. Put your finger in the ground. If you feel moisture up to your second knuckle, you're okay. If you don't feel moisture, you need to put a little bit of moisture out there. Week two onward, you check daily and water when it's dry to your knuckle again, right? So first week's getting it established. Second week is that you needed to let it dry out a little bit, but you don't want it to go dry, okay? Year two and three, you have to water once or twice weekly, very deeply for most plants. After that, most landscape plants are pretty well established and they can get by by minimum watering, especially if you're mulching and especially if you're grouping all your plantings to hold in that moisture. But... It all depends on plant type, canopies, microclimate, soil depth, mulch depth. That's why your soil probe is so important on all these things to really know what's going on underneath the ground, okay? And then I always recommend after new plantings, mycorrhizae soaks, mulching around them, get those plants off successful. Best times to water, I've asked this all the time. If you can, you wanna water in morning, okay? If you've got the if you've got the ability, water in morning and as early as you can once the sun comes up. <clears throat> our goal for watering is to fill up our soil profile with our moisture before the temperatures start coming around in order to evaporate that. It's also made so because if we do it later on the day when we sometimes get winds, we'll lose moisture because we're watering and it's being evaporated. So mornings usually are our best time around here for getting good soakings in before the temperatures or the wind starts moving up. But if you can't do it in mornings, Early evenings are fine. You know, just don't do it in the heat of the day when we get all that evaporation. You just don't want to do evenings all the time, okay? Because then things stay wet all the time and we can start having some problems by just too much moisture. So mornings are great because they get all that moisture in there and then things start drying out. So evenings are okay if it's used occasionally and even cloudy days. Used occasionally, that's fine. The, the whole key again is getting our soil profile filled up with the moisture checking with our soil probes, knowing that it's ready to go, and then let mother nature do her thing. Okay, water management depends on everyone about educating everyone about water because it's considered cheap, where in reality, it's just very inexpensive to buy. But in the big picture, water really is priceless. So I went a little over, I kind of apologize, even with my ramblings, um, but if there's more questions, let's answer those too. Um, I I'll just share. I just have one question um, cool. right now. Um, will soaker hoses pollute fruit trees as well as veggies? You know, great question. And I would recommend not using the soaker hoses for anything that we're going to be eating. So berry plants, um, fruit trees, anything like that, where you because those things can be leached in the soil. Then some of those things can be taken up in the roots is what they found. So just as a real good precaution, I wouldn't use them. Okay, that's good. And I don't see any other ones right now. Well, um, and what I could do is I'll throw out my email. My email is L A D is in David, D is in David, S is in Sam. So it's lad S at in harmony, I N H A R monycom so lad s at inharmony.com if you guys have any other questions um uh, feel free to email me i have you know give you resources give you advice anything i can do sometimes you know you guys go back and i threw a lot at you so sometimes you can go back and just some things uh, 
just want clarification on or something like that, please feel free to give me an email and I'll get right back to you. But I really appreciate the, the opportunity to talk to you guys about water tonight and uh, how important it is and, uh, um, and have a great gardening season. Thank you so much, Lad. That's really wonderful. Um, also, I wanted to say for those still here that in the chat, you can uh, save the chat. There's little dots next to where it says where you could uh, write to us as panelists. I put in a lot of those links um, that Lad was mentioning. So grab those there. Um, Lad, this was interesting. I constantly write down notes when I'm at these sessions. So I'm so happy. <laughs> um, you just have to write shorthand, right? I can't keep up. I even Sorry. tried to draw a tree. So there you go. <laughs> I, I just got another question. I, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have spoken so fast. Um, if I have an established landscape with exposed roots, do you recommend compost and mulch, or just a thick layer of mulch? Thick layer of mulch. Yep, because compost will. You know, yeah, I would mulch will be a lot easier for you. Just put a thick and arborist chips. I use it all the time in my pathways where the roots start exposing themselves and coming up put arborist chips or cedar chips over and become a little pathway um, or just cover them up, easiest thing to do. Great questions though. I, this, you got quality, quality people um, with their questions. These are outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thanks for addressing those lad throughout. I appreciate that people um, ask them when they were registering and then we can talk about what you want us to talk about, so. One last push for Thursday um, before we let you go is uh, go to everett.eventbrite.com and we'll have the rain garden uh, rebate class at noontime. So hopefully you can join us on the, the lunch hour and we'll be explaining what that process is for the city of Everett. And again, thank you to the city for sponsoring these classes. Thank you, Karen, for breaking in when you could to answer the questions. And thank you, Lad, so much uh, for uh, educating us all. This was wonderful. I saw one more Any quick question. Thought? I yeah, I saw one more question that popped up and said, can you use too much mulch? And the only time I've seen too much mulch is that if it's burying the crowns of the plants, because the, the crowns are supposed to be above ground and in air. So if you're putting too much over there and you're covering up your crowns, you'll actually get rot in those plants. So um, keep it away from your crowns, keep it away from the, like those bases like that, and you cannot use too much mulch. Put it down as thick as you can. But another great question, thank you. And I give me an email if there's any other questions. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful evening and we'll see you hopefully again on Thursday. Thanks, lad. Yeah. Good night, bye-bye, right. thank you. Bye.